Hello and welcome to New Central TV. I am Adebola Adeduba. The headlines. UK Parliament set for hot debate on Rwanda asylum plan. Kenya seeks swift resolution with Tanzania after flight ban. Cameroonian killed five others injured in detonated blasts. And details shortly. New Central now begins in Nigeria's capital, Abuja, where it, there is commemoration of this year's Armed Forces Remembrance Day. President Bola Tinobu laid wreaths as a mark of honor to soldiers who have paid the ultimate price with their lives at the National Arcade in Abuja. And this was part of celebrations to mark the 2024 celebration. Amadine Uyi reports. The event commenced at the National Arcade in Abuja with a parade by seven military personnel and veterans of the Nigerian army. In attendance were the leadership of the military and senior government officials. <laughs> President Bola Tinubu shortly arrived at the venue. From there, he proceeded with leaders of the judiciary and legislature where they pay their last Before respects to soldiers that have paid the ultimate price with their lives by the lane of reeds. After them, President Tinubu released the ceremonial white pigeons as a symbol of peace. Put your hands together, please. Thank you. Thank you. The That's event okay. ended with a change of guard ceremony. <laughs> Amadin Uyi, oh, reporting for News Central. In the meantime, the annual Armed Forces and Remembrance Day celebrations came to a climax on Monday with a laying of wreath by dignitaries across the state of the nation. In discourses around the day, the need to appreciate veterans and make the lives of the families of fallen heroes better took the center stage. Chingwe Ogele compiled this report sent by our correspondents across the country. When in active service, the forced men have the duty to protect lives and property of citizens and also protect the territories of the nation from possible outside attacks. Some sustain life-changing injuries while others lose their lives in the course of fighting terrorism, banditry and other forms of crime. In Omaha, the Abia state capital, the governor Alex Oti says the citizens and government have not done enough to encourage those in active service of security or even paid adequate attention to the legion. In a nation whose immense potential has been perennially blighted by the crisis of parochialism and preventer disposition of its leading elites, the military has managed accept during the darkest nights of our existence to distinguish itself as a body of patriots committed to the highest demands of law for fatherland, even in the face of existential threats. In Maiduguri, Borno State, Northeast, the government used today to call on terrorists to surrender to the Nigerian government to ensure peace is achieved for growth or face the consequences of terrorism. On the plateau, Governor Caleb Mutfuang was all promises to the Legion and the state. We made some commitments as government to assist the Nigerian Legion and the families of the fallen heroes thereby to benefit. And by the grace of God, this week I made a commitment in church yesterday that this week we are going to fulfill those promises. Some of the veterans and families, though hopeful of better days, expressed disappointment at the treatment they had been given over the years. Best of my knowledge, the uh, federal government has not done enough in this picture of taking care of the veterans. But in the recent times, they have stepped up their efforts.
it wasn't all that good. But I know this time things have improved tremendously. The government has tried to pay their pension, but for the other states, they are not carrying out the rules of retired citizens. They are not trying at all. The crime out there in different parts of the country is for an improved welfare services to the veterans and the families they leave behind. Nigeria should at this point move away from rhetoric to face realities. Because as the gun sounds and peace is restored, lives are lost and families are left heartbroken. In Omar Hefonyu Central, Shinwe Bukele. And now let's talk politics as we head to southern Nigeria, where the Rivers House Assembly has invited nine former commissioners who resigned from the state governor, Simeon Alaye Fubara, for fresh screening and confirmation. The nine commissioners resigned in December 2023 following a feud between Fubara and Yesom Wike, minister of the Federal Capital Territory. Clerk of the Rivers House of Assembly, Emeka Amadi, in a statement on Monday, said the commissioner nominees are expected to appear before the lawmakers on Wednesday. This development is part of the resolution reached after Fubara and Wike agreed to end the political field when President Bola Tinobo intervened. Wike and other Rivers stakeholders on December 18, 2023, signed an eight-point resolution, which includes resubmitting the names of all commissioners in Rivers State Executive Cantu, who resigned their appointment due to the political crisis in the state to the House of Assembly for approval. And still in River State, the Supreme Court has reserved judgment in the appeal filed by the governorship candidate of the All Progressives Congress, Patrick Tonye Cole, against the victory of the River State Governor, Simon Alaye Fubara, in March 18, 2023 governorship election. Mr. Tonye Cole's case is a consequence of the appeal court decision of 28th November, which dismissed his appeal for lacking sufficient and convincing evidence. The APC governorship candidate's contention is that of irregularities, non-compliance with the Electoral Act, and Fubara's continued signing of documents as the River State Council General after his nomination as the governorship candidate of the People's Democratic Party, PDP. A five-member panel headed by Justice Kudirat Kekereko reserved judgment on the appeal against all parties in the suit adopted their briefs of argument. And let's tell you that Hope Uzodima has been sworn in for a second term as the governor of Imo State following his re-election. He took the oath of office at the Dan Ayam Stadium in Uweri, the Imo State capital. The governor's inauguration came just minutes after Chinyiri Ekomaru took her oath of office as the deputy governor of Imo State. President Bola Chinobu, a former president, Olusegun Obasanjo, the Senate president, Godswill Akpabio, a speaker of the House of Representatives, Taju Dean Abbas, and other all progressives Congress chieftains were among those in attendance. In his speech, the governor promised to exceed his performance in the first term, thanking the people of the state for their support. Nigeria's ruling party, the All Progressive Congress, APC, has described the chieftain of the Labour Party, Professor Pat Utomi, as a serial promoter of mega parties. The National Publicity Secretary of the party, Felix Mocha, stated this in a statement issued on Monday while reacting to a statement cre credited to Utomi on a possible merger among the People's Democratic Party, PDP, the Labour Party, LP, and the new Nigeria People's Party, NNPP, ahead of 2027. Away from that, Minister of Foreign Affairs Yusuf Toga says Nigeria's participation at this year's World Economic Forum will provide an opportunity to woo foreign investors to Nigeria. He adds that Nigeria's attendance holds great economic benefit for the country. Vice President Kashim Shetima is the leader of Nigeria's delegation to the annual event at Davos, Switzerland. No fewer than 52 other heads of state, including China's President Xi Jinping and German Chancellor Olaf Scholz, as well as over 1,500 CEOs and chairpersons of the largest companies in the world, are expected at the global event. The 54th annual meeting of the World Economic Forum is scheduled for 15 to 19 January 2024 with a the theme, Rebuilding Trust.
Now, News Central will bring you live pictures from the World Economic Forum. And now let's turn attention to security matters. Following the abduction of six young girls in the Buari Area Council of the Federal Capital Territory, FCT, the Nigeria Police Force said it is intensifying plans to rescue the victims. The force also assured Nigerians that plans are ongoing to prevent further kidnapping cases across the country. Now, this development was made known in a statement signed by the force public relations officer, Olumuyiwa Adejobi, on Saturday. It comes after one of the girls, identified as Najiba, was reportedly killed by gunmen who abducted her and five other sisters in Abuja. Najiba and her sisters were abducted on January 9 alongside their father. It was also gathered that the gunmen later released their father, asking him to go get a ransom of 60 million naira for the release of her daughters before Friday, January 12. The hoodlums reportedly killed the oldest of the six girls, Najiba, and dumped her body somewhere for her parents to bury as they were unable to raise the money. And to talk about this, we're being joined live by Hamed Musa Hussaini, a security expert, as well as uh, Hadiza Shwaibo, who also had two of her younger brothers kidnapped last year in an attack in Dede community in Mwari, local government area in Abuja. Good morning. Glad to have you both join me. Can I hear, can I hear anything? Good morning. Okay, uh, Hadiza, can you hear me now? No audio. Okay, I'll proceed uh, with our first guest. Uh, let me ask you, as a security expert, uh, what are the key challenges and complexity that you think the Nigerian police uh, might face when it comes to executing intensive rescue operations for abducted victims, particularly in the Federal Capital Territory? All right, um, thank you. Um, so I think the Nigerian police... Um, is not uh, obviously it's not adequately prepared to deal with this kind of situations and um, there are a lot of problems that are actually impeding the Nigerian police from properly fulfilling its role in securing the resilience and also in resolving security challenges across the country like the one we have in Abuja but if you look at what is happening in Abuja it is nothing surprising because Abuja actually falls within the kidnapping belt of Nigeria because it borders with other kidnapping hotspots across the country. Um, you look at Kogi State, you look at Nasarawa, you look at Kaduna, you look at Niger State. So all these states are actually within what I call the kidnapping belt in Nigeria, the crime, you know, where you have um, um, gangs of criminals operating, you know, freely due to, you know, the nature of the terrain and, you know, the vast wealth of, you know, the Nigerian territory and the easy accessibility or you know, um, uh, opportunity for those criminals, you know, to move, you know, among or within, you know, different states across the country, to move, the, you know, their hostages or their victims, you know, from, you know, different locations. So these, uh, the nature of the terrain and lack of adequate resources on the part of Nigerian police is actually what is, you know, impeding its ability to respond to these kind of challenges. Ahmed, and, um, you know, the, yeah, go on. if I may just, you know, butt in there, what do you make of the plans mentioned by the police uh, public relations officer, and that's Olumu Yuwaade Jobi? How effective do you think his plans are when it comes to preventing further kidnapping cases across the country? Uh, what strategies are being employed to address these root causes? So the thing is, actually, we've heard about different plans by different, you know, um, uh, in police um, uh, leadership, you know, across, you know, over over different, you know, times. But the problem is in the implementation, because if you look at it now, we have those criminals openly and freely communicating with their victims or with the relatives of their victims over phone. And we have the security agencies, whether it is the police or the DSS, being able to track their location. But the problem is their inability to take action. So Nigerian authorities, so Nigerian police in this case, must establish effective deterrence. What I mean by deterrent is, yes, it is allowed to do whatever it takes to free hostages, whether it is by paying ransom or whatever. But the police or the Nigerian security agencies must establish, must ensure that these criminals do not live to 
enjoy or to benefit from the proceeds of their crimes. That is deterrent because it is not just after freeing the hostage, then the case is closed. You must pursue those criminals, whether they free the hostages, whether ransom is paid or not, you must pursue them. So when, it is, when, when, when you establish that level of you know, superiority, they understand that, okay, they cannot get away with their crimes, then they will now realize that, okay, that criminal venture itself does not pay. The, that's the only way. That's the only way they will reason, and then they will start, you know, to actually fold their crimes and uh, and take whatever um, offer that the government gives them in terms of rehabilitating them, or in terms of them, you know, leaving the crime entirely. Let me see if I have my second guest uh, there with us now. Hadiza Shuaibo, are you there? Okay, I believe she'll try to connect with us in the course of the news. Uh, but back to you, Hamid. Uh, what specific measures do you think the Nigerian police uh, can take to ensure security of citizens is ensured? All right, so we must first start with actually the issue of under-resourcing. We know the police, uh, just last year the Inspector General of Police was saying Nigeria actually needs about 170,000 more police officers, so 190,000 more police officers, additional police officers to secure the country adequately. And look at the new recommendation of police uh, population ratio is about one policeman for every 450 you know uh, uh, people. In Nigeria, we have uh, over 200 million population, so we have about one policeman to 600,000 people. But that's not even the story because if you look at it, out of the about 400,000 or nearly 400,000 police officers that we have, almost uh, 40 of them are actually not effectively deployed to protect the poor. They're either into VIP protection or some form of posting that do not directly translate into providing internal security for Nigerians. So we have to address that. There are a lot of, you know, um, uh, wastage in the, in, in the service where, where police officers have been posted to VIPs or to some other places that do not prime, suit their primary purpose. So we need to address that. Then there's the issue of training. They have to be adequately trained with modern tools and technologies and resources for them to effectively combat this kind of crime. Because these are emerging crimes that are coming up, you know, with time. And then the police need to keep pace with those evolving, you know, the, you know realities of, you know, the Nigerian um, security situation. So the idea of using all models or all the methods in order to confront emerging crime does not work actually anywhere in the world. So, and then thirdly, there has to be the issue of, you know, um, equipping them. And then, uh, as I said, uh, about training and equipping them, also properly motivating them. Because you cannot send a police officer to go and confront criminals with the possibility of him getting killed and other things. And then you do not provide, you know, for effective motivation and welfare for him and what happens even if in case he dies in service. So this is, so it's a, it has to be very, very comprehensive, you know, reform process, not just some kind of stopgap measures that the police will just take when there is a lot of outcry by Nigerians, and then when it dies and they just go back to their normal state of business, it doesn't work. Thank you so much for your time on the news. Hamed Musa Hussaina, a security expert, thank you once again. Thank you. You're welcome. Let's also tell you that inflation in Nigeria has risen to its highest rate in more than 27 years. Nigeria's Bureau of Statistics says the rate that the prices were increasing over the year was up for the 12th straight month. On average, the price of goods has risen to just under 29 compared to a year ago. The statistics office says the rise in the cost of basic foodstuffs, including bread, fruit and eggs, was higher. Analysts say higher fuel prices and a weaker currency, the Naira, have also contributed to the rise. When President Bola Chinubu took office last May, he immediately embarked on a series of bold economic reforms. The president scrapped a costly but popular fuel subsidy and devalued the currency to try to revive the growth. Earlier, Aki Fatunke, a chartered accountant, spoke to us on these developments. As a Christian, uh, what we have said to 28.92 percent uh, if you want to compare that to um, what we had in november 28.2 percent has been on for 11 months uh, for statisticians in fact econometricians uh, we knew this was going to happen in the back of weak currency quite right we are not earning enough and the Little that we were earning was uh, bedeviled, unfortunately, by the gulf that we had 
in the in the trust deficit. Um, Twenty percent by way of Pareto analysis, unless uh, by smiling to the banks without necessarily producing. And those bold reforms that you mentioned uh, were not wholesomely embraced. One and two, even those who put the reforms there were, in my mind, not a bit serious with the kind of discipline that needed to be seen um, from the driver of a vehicle uh, who has lost a tire. Uh, something needed to to have a given. And now to health-related matters. In the wake of the Dangote refinery's move into diesel and aviation fuel production, health experts are voicing apprehension over potential health and environmental hazards associated with refinery operations. The commencement of diesel and aviation fuel production at the Dangote refinery has sparked many reactions, as critical stakeholders are also saying this might be the catalyst to have the Nigerian refineries revived and revamped. It was earlier reported that the Dangote Re Petroleum Refinery was set to start producing automotive gas oil, also known as diesel, and the jets A1 or aviation fuel in January 2024, while the production of petrol was being delayed by the supply of crude oil in installment. While commending the Dangote Refinery's strides in diesel and aviation fuel production, health experts are sounding a cautionary note emphasizing the need to address potential health and environmental hazards associated with refinery operations. And joining us on the news this morning to explore this perspective further is Dr. Lars Udeize, and he is the founder, Talk Health Niger. Good morning, glad to have you join me. Hi, good morning. Thanks for having me. All right. Uh, what do you think, you know, is the possible impact of production processes at refineries uh, such as emissions and waste disposal to the health of residents? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, congratulations to Nigeria from the economic perspective uh, that uh, the Dangote refinery have started operations. Uh, from that perspective, it's believed that it's going to create jobs and make the products more available. But of course, as you mentioned, uh, it raised significant health concerns uh, when the picture uh, of the refinery shows significant presence of gas flaring. You know, uh, that's kind of got me worried. Um, there is plethora of evidence uh, that shows that gas flaring is inimical to the environment, it releases toxic gases uh, that contributes to climate change, and it's also uh, affects the health of persons, who, especially those who live around them. Um, a, a World Bank report in 2020 shows that the, in Niger Delta, for instance, about uh, 2 million Nigerian people live very close you know, to places where gases are being fled. So and now with the presence of Dangote refinery in Lagos, uh, with Lagos having a higher population density, uh, you can imagine the additional number of Nigerians that be exposed to this. And uh, gases like the greenhouse uh, gases, uh, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, uh, sulfur dioxide, nitric oxide, you know, and uh, soot, the particulate matters that you could recall some months ago, the Portacot has significant presence of the soot. And this causes respiratory uh, problems for children. It can increase the the risk of asthma, it can also cause respiratory problems for adults, especially elderly people like the chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And some benzene and some of these uh, chemicals have been shown to be carcinogens, increases the rate of cancer. It can cause respiratory problems, and some persons might even lead to some congenital malformation. So th th these are all uh, significant uh, problems that you could pose. Dr. Eze. Uh, yeah. In light of all you have mentioned and considering Nigeria's economic reliance on oil, how can we balance the need for fuel production with minimizing environmental impacts? Yes, uh, the experts have already found various ways of flaring less gas, and I was really expecting that uh, in 2024, or a refinery that was built within the past three, four years, 
uh, was going to deploy some of those uh, technologies, you know, that either uh, makes gas flaring very minimal. If at all, it should be flared. So uh, I'm not an expert in, in that field, so I may not go into the details, but I know from reports uh, I've read that there are technologies that could make uh, minimize this or even make it uh, not present at all. So um, this is what I think should have been done in the case of uh, Dangote refinery, you know, so because even looking at the picture that was posted, you could see a lot of buildings. Uh, a, a research uh, done in the US in North Dakota showed that uh, people living up to 60 miles from a location of gas flare, you know, are at risk of uh, uh, worse health conditions, increased hospitalization, and respiratory problems. And 60 miles is 96.6 kilometers. So just plus that from the location of the, the new refinery, you know, uh, plot that perimeter around uh, Lagos, and you can see the number of persons who potentially, you know, are exposed to having worse health problems. I know you've referenced uh, technology making an impact when it comes to the operations of refinery. Uh, beyond technology, beyond the location, are there other international best practices when it comes to the activities of refineries? Yes, uh, refineries, like any business, you know, should do an environmental impact assessment, uh, which I believe this must have been done. And uh, looking at the environmental impact assessment, uh, you'll be able to know the potential uh, you know, impact it will have on the environment and, of course, on health, because the, the, the environment, everything that happens in the environment affects our health one way or the other. So that being done, communities around there must be involved in the mitigation efforts. Uh, apart from the gas being fled, are there other products from the refinery that could potentially harm the environment? How are there, how is waste management uh, being done? Uh, of course, it's good that a lot of waste from uh, refining are also things that are used, uh, you know, that are of other uses uh, in manufacturing and also in the value chain. So, but the community is very important, must be involved. You know, they must be sensitized to, to know the potential uh, hazards they face. And also they must be taught on how to protect themselves. And the communities themselves should also educate themselves on these things and ask relevant questions to the authorities. Because uh, we know that uh, the most important concern for investors is usually to make profit and not necessarily to mitigate health. Thank you so much for your insight on the news, Dr. Lars Ude Eze, founder, Talk Health Niger. Thank you once again. Thank you for having me. And coming up, Mauritius raises cyclone alerts to maximum. We'll bring you details of these and more when we get back. Stay with us. And now let's move to East Africa, where political tensions is running high in the Comoros, with violent incidents reported one day after the Indian Ocean Island nation held a presidential vote. Comorans are awaiting official results from Sunday's first round election, which is expected to show incumbent leader President Azali Aswamani with a comfortable lead. But supporters of the five opposition candidates have accused electoral authorities of delaying voting in their electoral strongholds and the harassing polling observers. The result of the first round is expected sometime this week, but tension is already rising on the Comoros three islands, Grand Comor, Anjouan and Moheli, home to about 870,000 people. And Kenya's foreign minister, Musalia Mudavadi, has called for the swift resolution of a diplomatic dispute over a flight by Tanzania on flag carrier Kenya Airways. Tanzania on Monday imposed a ban that halted passenger flights between Nairobi 
and Dar es Salaam, raising concerns among citizens of the two countries about escalating tensions between the East African neighbors. Modavadi said after discussions with Tanzanian counterpart Bakamba, they have agreed that their respective civil aviation authorities will work together to have the matter resolved amicably within the next three days. The sudden ban arose from a disagreement over cargo flight operations. Tanzania sought approval for all cargo flights by Air Tanzania to Nairobi, but Kenyan authorities denied the request, citing technical and logistical concerns. Mauritius raised a cyclone warning alert to maximum on Tuesday and told its inhabitants to stay indoors, but said tropical storm Belal was moving away from the Indian Ocean Island nation. According to the Mauritius Meteorological Service, MMS, in a statement, gusts of wind up to around 120 kilometers an hour were hitting the remote island. Belal has already battered the French overseas territory of Reunion, leaving one person dead. The MMS said a cyclone class 1 in 4, the maximum level, was now in force on the island, a magnet for tourists attracted by stunning white beaches and crystal clear waters. The statement advised the public to maintain all precautions and remain indoors. The Democratic Alliance has slammed South Africa's president, Cyril Ramaphosa's decision to send the South African National Defense Force to the M23 infiltrated Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. The opposition calls this risky and calls for a reversal. According to report, the SANF was deployed in December 2023 to lead the SADAC military mission to Eastern DRC to replace the UN's MONUSCO, whose mandate is ending this year after a 20-year deployment. The SANF deployment is expected to work with the DRC National Security Forces to fight the M23 rebels. And meanwhile, military experts have warned that without proper air cover, as well as transport and air element, the Sand and Sadak Intervention Brigade will find it difficult to operate in hostile terrain. Kobus Marias, Democratic Alliance Shadow Minister of Defense and military veterans, joined us earlier to unpack these latest developments. We are not opposed to be involved in regional peacekeeping missions, not at all in principle. Uh, because we have to be part of securing a safe environment. However, whenever you deploy soldiers in especially a hostile uh, a circumstances and situation, you have to make sure about two very important things. And it deals with resources. You have to make sure that your prime mission equipment, that your shoulders are, uh, soldiers are using are competent and superior to that of your adversaries. Now, the previous time that we defeated the M23, we especially um, relied on our attack helicopters, the Rayfog helicopters, which are lethal weapons, and they are very critical. There were also five support transport Oryx helicopters for medivacs, for evacs, for transport of people, soldiers, and and, and ammunition and, and, and uh, other goods. This time around, we don't have a situation where any of the Rayford attack helicopters are available. And at this stage, only one of the five Oryx helicopters is available. You're watching News Central Now. Still ahead. Donald Trump celebrates Iowa win. We have details of these very shortly. Join us again. And outside the African continent, Donald Trump delivered a speech following his win at the Iowa caucus, vowing to resolve Russia's war on Ukraine and the Israel-Hamas war, as well as seal up the border between the U.S. and Mexico and expand oil and gas drilling. 
Donald Trump also told Americans it was time for the country to come together after he won the Iowa caucuses, cementing his status as the likely Republican challenger to take on President Joe Biden in November's election. The former president has led polling for more than a year, but the Republican contest was seen as the clearest insight yet into whether he can convert his advantage into a stunning White House return. Really, uh, rough on the president, but I have to say that he is the worst president that we've had in the history of our country. He's destroying our country. So, Russia would have never attacked. Israel would have never been attacked. The Ukraine situation is so horrible. The Israeli situation is so horrible. What's happened? And uh, we're going to get them solved. We're going to get them solved very fast. I actually said, you can come together. We're going to drill baby drill right away. Yeah. Drill baby drill. We're going to seal up the border. Because right now we have an invasion. We have an invasion of millions and millions of people that are coming into our country. I can't imagine why they think that's a good thing. It's a very bad thing. Britain says it will send 20,000 armed forces personnel to one of NATO's largest exercises since the Cold War. In a speech at Lancaster House, Defense Secretary Grant Shapps warned of increasing threats to the Western-led alliance. Shapps says the deployment is aimed at providing reassurance over the menace posed by Russia's President Vladimir Putin following his invasion of Ukraine. While speaking on the UK-US strikes against the Iran-backed Houthis in Yemen last week, Shapps says the strikes were intended as a single action. And that's why I can announce today the UK will be sending some 20,000 personnel to lead one of NATO's largest deployments since the end of the Cold War. It will see our military joining forces with counterparts from 30 NATO countries, plus Sweden, providing reassurance against the Putin menace. Our carrier strike group will be out in full force with our magnificent flagship HMS Queen Elizabeth leading the way. And flying from her decks will be the fifth generation F-35 Lightning Jets. Today's NATO is bigger than ever. But the challenges are bigger too. And that's why the UK has committed nearly the totality of our air, land and maritime assets to NATO. Um, so we have um, hit the Houthis, as you said. We intend it as a, a single action. We'll now monitor very carefully to see what they do next, how they respond, uh, and we will see uh, from there. On the Red Sea, um, nobody can say that we did not give the Iranian-backed Houthis every possible warning to cease and desist. We made it very clear. I worked very closely with our American allies on the messaging uh, on this. We sent messages direct and indirectly Following attacks by the U.S. and the U.K., thousands of people have assembled in Hodeida, the rebel-held city in Yemen. Iran backs Yemen Houthis claims that the U.S. and British interests were legitimate targets and launched deadly strikes against the rebels following weeks of disruptive attacks on Red Sea shipping. The Iran-backed Houthi rebels seized Sana'a in 2014 and have been at war with the Saudi-led coalition. They came under heavy bombardment overnight with a series of military targets hit. Wahaoliyom <laughs> 
نحن جاهزين للرد والرد سيكون عنيف وأقوى بإذن الله تعالى وسننتظر لأن الشعب الياباني متوكل على الله قوات البحرية جاهزة جاهزة وفي أكمل جهوزيتها ولا نخاف الضربات التي استهدفت بلادنا يوم أمس أن ضرباتنا ستتضاعف وستكون أقوى وسيندحر وسنكبره على الفرار ومغادرة البحر الأحمر بإذن الله تعالى And now let's take you to Davos in Switzerland, where the World Economic Forum is taking place. We have the vice president, who is part of the panel. Reduce the barriers uh, to trade. And then second, uh, soon the ministers of trade will conclude the protocol on digital trade, uh, which will further enhance competitiveness of Africa's economy. And as we all know, this is where uh, Africa has a, 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 an advantage okay. in digital innovations. And so the protocol will, will harness uh, that potential and provide that regulatory framework, the market access, uh, to enable um, uh, Africa's digital economy to continue to, to power ahead. OK. Um, uh, I'll just also use this uh, moment to uh, uh, extend a point that uh, Mr. Mena was making about the uh, focus for this year, of course, being on looking at uh, uh, trade and services. Uh, later on this afternoon, in fact, we're going to be hosting a, a discussion around frictionless trade, just looking at unlocking some of those barriers uh, to uh, smoothen the, the trade and services, as it were. But you were talking about milk. And uh, so I'll uh, stick in the agricultural uh, lane, if we can. Um, Ms. Fernanda, just in terms of the work that Yara is doing, and uh, perhaps even reflecting on some of the uh, feedback uh, from uh, Mr. Mena about the AFCFTA so far, uh, just talk to us about uh, your broad thinking of it, but uh, ultimately uh, the importance of agriculture from Yara. We know it's really important in terms of the uh, jobs uh, opportunity, also the contribution to GDP. But towards sustainable development and how you're seeing it being affected a lot better? Absolutely. Um, first of all, I wanted to build a bit on the analogy or on the, on the saying that you said about waking up the giant, right? So I am Brazilian, uh, born and raised, of, obviously, of um, African heritage as well. And, and I grew up seeing my country also being referred as a giant, a giant that never wake up, that has so much potential. But I think if there's one area where Brazil really woke up and, and got it really right is agriculture. So and I see that say, those same opportunities, that same potential uh, for Africa as well. So the same passion uh, that I have for my country, I have for um, trying to transform and trying to, to transition African agriculture, of course, through my company, uh, to a more sustainable way. So um, the, the sector is predominantly um, made up of smallholder farmers, um, right? And, and, and with that, it comes a, a myriad of, of challenges. Um, uh, fertilizer application rate being one of them because that's that's a, an obvious one that we deal with in my company so just to give you an idea today per acre uh, Africa applies five to six times less fertilizer than than you know the global average rates so this of course has a consequence not only in yield but in uh, over mining of nutrients from the soil um, acidification and, and and that of course um, carries um, um, you know Know, negative repercussions for, for a long time. Um, but of course, just increasing uh, fertilization is not enough, so we need to find ways to increase yield, but in a, you know, in a much more sustainable way. Um, so we need to focus much more on, on nutrients rather than you know, just over-fertilizing um, soils. Every nutrient count today, again, a smallholder um, farmer in Africa is not applying more than two nutrients. Uh, and that is not enough, right? So we need to um, tailor-made solutions, tailor-made solutions for, for farmers. Um, 
like we did um, in, in, in Yara uh, by developing um, something specifically for maize farmers that give them at least four to five nutrients in a pricing point that they can they can actually afford. So there are many, many things that we can, that we can do, uh, but it's not only about products, it's also about the farmers themselves. So it's about this knowledge gap that still exists in, in, in African um, uh, agriculture today. Um, so how do we move them to, to learning more about new practices, regenerative practices, right? So today a farmer is still practicing agriculture like his parents or her parents, grandparents. So there is a, a paradigm shift that we need to do here. Um, teaching farmers how to, to grow, but also mitigate uh, emissions at the same time, have better soil management practices, um, um, better resource efficiency, not only nutrients, but water. I mean, it is a rain-fed agriculture, um, so we need to find better ways uh, for them to use uh, water, um, when they, which is a, a scarce resource, and at the same time, protecting also biodiversity. Sure. So I think- Can I hit pause yes, on that absolutely. Uh, for a second? Uh, we are uh, now being joined by His Excellency uh, Shatima. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Better late than never. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we forgive you. We understand the uh, traffic constraints. Um, I actually went to the other end. Oh. I had to walk down. The other end. Oh dear. Yeah. Which one of the uh, team members briefed you that way? So let me deal with it. <laughs> um, Fernanda, uh, you would uh, you were talking there. If you're able to just pick up uh, where you left off. Absolutely. Um, no, just just concluding. So I think um, it's uh, all that we do. However, needs to lead to better livelihoods for farmers. So if if farmers are not winning, then then we are not winning. Then we are all losing. Sure. Can I ask you? Um, also to reflect on uh, what uh, Mr. Mena said, just this uh, tool or perhaps this innovation that the continent is really excited about right now, this um, system that essentially removes the middle, the middle man or the middle currency and allows uh, countries to uh, transact uh, without the added layer of the conversion into the third currency as it were. And, and, uh, What's the experience of uh, perhaps maybe some of your farmers, or what do, you, what do you think the potential of that could be as you look down the line in terms of uh, increasing uh, the level of trade, particularly within agriculture? I, I think uh, if that comes to, uh, you know, fully to, to fruition and to life, I think will be absolutely amazing uh, for, for the farmers. As, as I mentioned, if the farmers win, then we all win. I think one of the, the, the key uh, issues that farmers in Africa also face today is, as you said, you know, is this middleman who, um, you know, acts as an intermediary and in the end, right, the, let's say the, the, the profits don't necessarily stay, uh, right, with the farmers as, as, um, as they should. Um, we also see um, issues around um, difficulties for, for lending, um, you know, all of finance, so the, the financial system today is not really super geared up for smallholder farmers. So I think if we find solutions um, to, to, to improve um, lending or insurance uh, for smallholder farmers, I think, you know, those, those, those things will come a long way into resolving many of those issues. I was in a session yesterday um, and I found that super interesting. Someone came up with this idea of, uh, okay, when farmers are, are trying to raise funds, they put their land as collateral, right? So why don't we design a system where if we can prove that these farmers are using regenerative practices in their agriculture, so suddenly the, 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 the value of their assets will go up. So if we have a house, if we build an extra room, two rooms, the, the value of the asset will go up, right? So why is that not the same for farmers when they're actually using practices that are better for nature? So I think there are you know, several things that we can do um, yeah, to, to help them on okay. that regard. Okay. Your Excellency, so just to bring you in, so we've been talking about uh, scaling the uh, continent, as, as, as you know, um, just how to really get uh, Africa to punch uh, above its weight, as we know that it does have the potential to do. And I suppose you cannot have a conversation about that uh, without having a conversation about Nigeria 
and its role mm -hmm. and its uh, potential and the opportunity also that uh, it presents. So perhaps your uh, broad level views so on this topic of scaling Africa and uh, particularly your experience uh, of Nigerian commerce in participating under the AFC. And that's the World Economic Forum happening in Davos, Switzerland, where we have panel discussions going on. The vice president of Nigeria, Kashim Shetima, is also part of the panelists. We also have other speakers there as Wamkele Mene, Sunil Bahati Mital, Mary Vilakazi, Kashim Shetima, uh, of course, our vice president there, right there, as part of the panelists. And